Um, the first is um, thinking back about, uh, sort of finishing up where we left off yesterday, thinking about how we encode information. Um, and some pretty strong evidence. Um, one example of a whole family of dozens of experiments that have been done to show that in sensory systems in a variety of organisms, um, from little house flies to tiny little microscopic uh, nematode worms um, to, uh, to monkeys to mice, um, cats, uh, and even in some cases, um, to the extent where they were able to measure it in humans, um, sensory systems really do have some, have a reasonable amount of reliability in the way they encode information. Um, sensory systems are not perfect in their reliability, um, but if you think back to what we were doing yesterday, um, when we talked about uh, the different sensory systems, or sorry, the, imagining one, one cell in the visual system, um, way back over you, way back over here, um, that's looking at a peach or looking at an apple. Um, if you, in fact, this, this is made up data, but it is very similar to what you actually see, um, where uh, if you look at an individual sensory neuron in the visual system, or the olfactory system, or the um, auditory system, or uh, somatic sensory system, um, and you show the same stimulus over and over again, and compare it to a second stimulus, or even three or four different stimuli, then in a single sensory neuron, um, sometimes the rate differs, between these two stimuli, but even if the rate is the same as it was in the example we talked about yesterday, um, different stimuli will give you different patterns of action potentials, and um, it is possible to, um, with a fair amount of reliability, figure out what, um, what an organism is seeing based on the time. And so we're going to return to that um, just a little bit more by finishing up the discussion about that house flight data that we started at the end of class. Um, but that is really exists as an illustration of one example case um, where, where um, we have a lot of good evidence from a lot of different organisms that precise spike times really does have information present in it about what you're seeing out there. Um, okay, and so, uh, and so, here I've got this, this uh, cartoon from The Simpsons, this image of, uh, of Homer's brain, uh, you know, uh, cartoonized because uh, we like to make fun of Homer and The Simpsons. But, um, but the reason that I showed this image here is because to me it really captures the idea that I am this brain stuck inside a skull completely isolated from the external world. Um, and uh, in fact, your, your only contact, here we sort of see like a spinal cord coming down. Your only contact with the external world is not just the spinal cord. That's where most of the somatosensory information comes in. Um, but we also have the uh, auditory nerve and olfactory nerves and some other nerves that carry touch information and taste information and, uh, and um, visual information and all of that coming in as well. But we've got sort of a, 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 a large but, but countable number of inputs that are coming in. Uh, and yet, as this isolated brain, we've got this nearly infinite number of things that may be out there in the world. And uh, in order to interact with that world appropriately, we need to be able to take this sort of countable number of inputs and deduce from it what of the nearly infinite number of things out there are really going on. Um, and in order to do that, um, it at least seems very plausible and makes a lot of sense that, that the brain is going to be taking advantage of all of the different information that's available to it. Um, and in fact, there's a whole other family of experiments um, related to what we've been talking about with Bayes' theorem that shows that your brain really does take into account prior knowledge, knowledge from other senses, you know, the McGurk effect we talked about with language, and, uh, and contextual clues that um, really drive at a very early level the way you perceive sounds or images or whatever is out there. Um, and that is the brain taking advantage of, again, every clue that it possibly can to make sense of these small number of inputs and figure out this, this vast number of potential outputs. Okay, so 
Any questions? Do people have any questions left over from the last couple of class periods um, about Bayes' theorem or about timing-based decoders versus rate-based decoders versus um, uh, versus um, label line decoders? Any leftover questions about any of that? Actually, before I draw. Um, before I draw the, uh, the, the sort of six panel diagram that we've been talking about, I want to write up sort of one other thing here um, so we can refer back to it. Um, so there are, we, we talked a little bit last time about the types of decoders. Um, and these are, so, so, so a, a lot of the approach that we're going to be doing here in trying to understand how our brain makes sense of all of these incoming action potentials is to um, use a computer or um, in a simpler case use pen and paper but one way or another look at those action potentials that are coming in that we're able to record with an electrode if I was sticking an electrode in an animal sensory system look at those action potentials and then see how much we can get out, how much we can figure out about what's at the animals seeing out in the world if we just look at who's firing. How much can we see about the animals, what the animals see in the world if we look at who's firing and how fast they're firing, but nothing about the time. And then how much can we deduce about what's out there in the world if we look at who's firing, how fast they're firing, and the times that they're firing. Um, and so there's sort of different levels of complexity of a decoder. Um, and so our simplest decoder is just a labeled line decoder, which just asks who's firing. Some neurons are active, some are not. That's all we want to know, yes or no, for all of these 10,000 or 100,000, um, depending on how complex the organism is, different inputs coming in, which of them are active, which of them are yes or no. Um, and that is going to give us a lot of information. It's not going to give us everything, but it's going to give us a lot of information. And if um, and and uh, and it is incredibly valuable. Um, and um, and uh, in the coming discussion, we're going to sort of put it to the side because we're going to be compar comparing a couple more slightly complicated decoders. Um, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the knowledge of just which neurons are firing and which neurons aren't is the most important piece of information you can have. Um, then we have sort of an intermediate complexity decoder. Actually, use a different color for that to distinguish it better. So our intermediate complexity decoder is, um, is rate. So there we ask, again, who's firing and how fast. So if I know the speed of every neuron, then anyone with a zero is not firing, anyone with anything else is. Um, and, uh, and with that, uh, so this is certainly going to give me at least as much information as the labeled line decoder. And assuming that some neurons are firing faster than others, then it's going to give me a little bit more to work with. Um, and so uh, we're going to do at least as well figuring out what's out there in the world if we have knowledge not only of who's firing, but also how fast they are. And so this is necessarily um, a, more, a more rich information source. Um, and then our um, and, and, and actually for both of these, um, there's, there's complete agreement that this is definitely important. Both of these, are, everyone agrees that if you want to understand what's going on out there, in, in, um, definitely important and also definitely used. If I'm, an, if I'm uh, in any nervous system, is going to be paying attention to who's firing and paying attention to how fast they're firing. Um, and there's widespread agreement that that is for sure the case. Um, then our, our most complex source of information, 
um, is to uh, is to look at time, and that says. Oh, and, and one other thing about these, they're definitely important, definitely used, and here we're using a sort of um, broad time window. Again, for these, for these first two. Using a broad time window for these first two. Um, with the timing-based decoders, now what we're going to say, now what we're going to look at is, um, is, again, which neuron fires, um, and what is the precise, um, maybe one to three millisecond resolution time of every spike. The broad time window for these other two, I mean maybe let's say a tenth of a second, a hundred milliseconds. So we're going to chunk, so for these two, we chunk our time over to 100 milliseconds and say, in this 100 milliseconds, who's active and how many spikes did they fire in that 100 milliseconds? The next 100 milliseconds, who's active, how many spikes did they fire um, for this second? Here now, instead, we're saying, instead of dividing our time into 100 milliseconds, we're going to say, um, over, over this whole 100 milliseconds, chunk it up into 100 little tiny pieces and say, at every millisecond, which neuron's firing and which neuron's not. And so if we have something like this going on, where um, response one, response in neuron one, is do, 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 um, and then um, response, uh, I guess response in neuron one given stimulus A, and then response in neuron one given stimulus B, um, might be, again, four spikes, but sort of more evenly spaced out. Um, if this is our 100 millisecond time window, from here to here, then this simple code can't tell the difference, they're both firing. This slightly more complicated code can't tell the difference because they're both firing the same number of spikes in that time window. But this code can say, okay, we're going to see like what are the precise times of those spikes. Um, and then we can actually tell the difference between those. Um, and just like the, the rate code completely encompasses all of the information in our labor line code, this timing code will completely encompass all of the information in our rate code. Because if I know, if over this 100 millisecond window, I know the time of every single action potential, then I know, I can say, okay, you've given me the time, you, 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 you by definition have told me how many there are, right? If you tell me the times of all four, then I can figure out, okay, there were four of them. Um, and so, again, this is going to necessarily encompass this. Um, and we can even draw this as like a Venn diagram where our complex code of timing fully encompasses everything we could know about rate, and that fully encompasses everything that we can know about just who's firing. Um, if you're going to pick one source of information, this is going to be the most important. Um, and probably this is going to be the next most important. Um, but we for sure get all of that. Actually, point the diagram, not the diagram technically. Um, yeah, so we for sure get all of that. Um, okay, so, so yeah, so what questions do people have about these sort of different levels of complexity that we can look at information. Okay, so, um, okay, so the, as we're going to see today and a little bit into tomorrow, the debate about this, um, there's sort of broad, widespread agreement that these two sources of information are for sure used by the nervous system. Um, the debate is, to what extent does the nervous system actually use this? Um, and there's sort of two sides to that. And so I'm just going to quickly, again, sort of for reference, redraw up here our, um, our diagram um, that we've been looking at. So we've got stimulus one, stimulus two, et cetera. Um, and then we've got our process of encoding, or I guess 
actually, I guess, say, so these are sensors, and then what they do is a process of encoding, and what comes out the back end of that is, um, is, um, is, our, is in our sensory neurons some set of responses, where now we've got, for each neuron, it's got some, um, the response in neuron one might be to do that, the response in neuron two maybe is to do nothing, maybe neuron three gets really, goes really crazy, whatever. Um, and so all of this up here is encoding. All of this down here, then we've got sort of our rest of our brain, um, which connects up with like some higher processing centers. And um, in the rest of our brain, the job is to do decoding, which is equivalent to saying classifying. Um, and, uh, and there's sort of you know, additional processing that goes on, um, and also um, context and other senses all get brought in. And this feeds back and connects up so that we can be nice and be very um, logical and Bayesian about what we do so that we are aware of um, prior knowledge as and take that into account in our decoding, um, which allows us to, to be more accurate than if we just, uh, if we didn't pay attention to that source of information. Um, and again, also, there's widespread agreement that, um, that the nervous system does use other senses, context, prior knowledge um, to help in the decoding process. And then what we're going to do is create a perception, which is just to say, of all of the possible stimuli, which ones do I think are most likely? And so if my estimate is that somebody said dog instead of log, then maybe it was phonetically ambiguous, but based on the prior knowledge and as close as I can match the sounds that they made, my best estimate is that the word spoken is dog. Uh, and so there's our estimated stimulus number one, uh, estimated stimulus number two, and on and on and on, all of the things that we perceive. Okay, so. If, well, okay, yeah, so, so let's, let's, that's, sort of, that's sort of the overview of this. Any, any sort of remaining questions about that right now? So back over here, brain in a skull, isolated from the world. Um, so what, what uh, looking at this, you can ignore the bottom. The bottom is sort of a summary across time of what these things do. But um, you can really see. So these, these plots, I think we looked at them once or twice before, but these are, these are called raster plots. Um, it's where you, um, every row is a different time that you showed the animal the same stimulus. And then every tick mark in that row represents the time of an action potential. On that iteration of showing the animal the stimulus, you show the animal the same exact stimulus 50 times or 100 times and record what the responses are. And in the case of a boring stimulus, the neuron doesn't really respond. It has some spontaneous firing that it does, um, but that spontaneous firing is not correlated in any way with the stimulus. If instead you give the same, um, the same changing, rapidly moving stimulus, and give the exact same visual stimulus that has these changing, rapidly um, moving properties of it, um, but the exact same pattern of change in rapid movement 50 times or 100 times to the animal, and record the action potentials there, you'll see that there are periods during the stimulus as the bar is moving down, where the neuron fires very rapidly, and other periods in the stimulus where the neuron is quiet. And actually, let me move back over here for one other thing. So one thing that we can do is, so in, in, in a brain, in, an, in a natural nervous system like the fly, there'll be sensors, and there are decoders and perceptions that the fly has. Um, 
And so, um, or estimates that the flies are of a system because of what's out there. Um, and so we can do that um, as a, as the fly does all that internally. But also, we can take these and record the action potentials. In this case, we're recording from just one neuron. But we could record, in principle, from many neurons. And then what we can do is take those action potentials that we record and feed them into a computer or just look at them on a piece of paper and one way or another um, have an artificial decoding system. Um, whether that's pen and paper, or if you have to be more sophisticated and more mathematical about it, you feed it into a computer. Um, and so then, in that case, what we are doing is um, basically the same job the fly's doing, right? The fly's nervous system's job is to figure out what's out there, the stimulus, the top thing over there, given the action potentials that it's seeing. And so we can say, okay, I'm going to play the part of the bottom half. I'm going to play the part of the rest of the brain. Um, and I'm going to see um, what estimates I, as a person with pen and paper, or what estimates my computer as um, something that has more com computational capacity than you with pen and paper, can make what, um, what, uh, what estimated stimuli I can make given this. So in other words, we don't tell our computer what the stimulus is. We tell the computer the action potentials. And we also tell the computer the probability of a response given a variety of stimuli. But we don't tell it what the stimulus was this time. And we ask our computer, we ask our computer, what is the probability of a certain stimulus given the response that you've seen? So we give it this relationship, and then we ask it to calculate this relationship and figure out what stimulus is the most likely one. And so what we can do is we can, um, and then we also give this, give the computer, give the computer. Um, so we give it the relationship that we know. We also give it the responses. But we can be a little bit clever about how we give it the responses. We could give it just who's firing and not tell it the, the rates of the neurons that are firing. We could tell it who's firing, what speed they're firing at over a sort of broad, broadish half a tenth of a second time window. Or we can give it precise time of every single action potential. And then we can compare how well it does, figuring out what's out there if we give it more and more information. Um, and so that's one, um, one way that we can start to ask how a nervous system might decode things. So that's sort of where we're going. But, um, I want to kind of pause there for a second. What what questions do people have about this idea? It's got to be so. I'm really going to wait until something does something. So, you sure. So. Sure, yeah. Um, what types of like computer programs are being is it being fed into like is it just looking at the stimulus or is it trying to like model the brain? Um oh yeah, great question. So um generally speaking, uh we're not trying to model the brain in this. Um and in fact uh there are um there are uh, statistical and pure mathematical techniques that you can do to prove that if you've got this relationship right, the probability of response given the stimulus, if we got that right, um, then um, 
then, and I just take this on faith because a lot of people who have to do you know morale with me tell you it. Um, but um, that it is that you can prove that a particular classifier is doing the best that any possible classifier in the universe could do, given this and whatever responses. And so again, these responses, these responses, we'll just say we're not going to worry about label line because everyone agrees on that. So we either give it the rate information only, or we give it the timing information. And so you can prove, if you, if you build your classifier appropriately, then it is possible to prove that your classifier is doing as well as anything in the universe possibly could do at figuring out the stimulus given the information you're giving it. Um, and so one kind of way that we're going to probe this is to say, so for example, if we give it the rate, and our computer that's doing the best anything in the universe could do given just that rate information doesn't do as well as the animal, then that tells us that the animal must be using something more than rate. Um, and so we're not trying to build a computer that represents the brain because we have incomplete knowledge. Uh, people do that for other reasons. But we're not trying to build a computer that represents the brain um, and, and tries to figure out how the brain actually does it in this case. Here we're just building our mathematically ideal classifier um, and feeding it different amounts of information to see how well it does. And then we're going to compare that back with how well the animal does at that. And that's, that's sort of where we're going. But yeah, that's a great question. Other questions? Sure, yeah. Um, so how do we, how do we know what the animal perceives? Um, for this case, we don't, but we'll talk about some more we do in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, what else? Yeah, sure. Um, do most simple organisms have, like, similar characters, or is it all the same? Thing? Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, yeah, I think that that's totally fair to say that more simple organisms have different decoders. Um, all organisms do, to a certain extent, have a sense of context and a memory of past events. Um, at least everything from like uh, from like tiny nematodes with 300 neurons up to us, um, and all organisms do have um, do have um, you know uh, multiple sensors. In some cases, it might be a small countable like handful number. In other cases, it might be tens of thousands. Um, and so you have to take that into consideration as you're designing your tests. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so that's, that's definitely um, a, a, an important consideration to be aware of. But the idea is um, if a simple, um, we'll talk about leech coming up, which has um, something like 300 neurons in every segment of its body. Leeches barely have a brain. Um, they actually have more neurons in their tail than they do in their head. Um, and, uh, but leeches barely have a brain, and most of the processing happens in these sort of 300 neuron chunks that just sort of come down the body. Um, and so if, if a leech or a house fly uses timing to decode things, then probably I'm at least going to do that too, is sort of the, uh, one, of the, one of the implicit assumptions. Okay, so, but, um, it, I mean, I wanted to sort of give us a sense of where we're going, but in a sense, I'm actually getting a little bit ahead of, 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 um, of some of these steps to this. So, um, so before we ask about whether a neuron, whether a nervous system uses precise spike times, there's sort of a a first question that we need to consider, which is, is there even any information present in spike times? So if we go back over here, um, and we just kind of look at, look at this, um, the, the right side, uh, and there's a period where, so our stimulus has some sort of like little jagged up, and then jagged down, and then something like that. Our stimulus is doing something like that. Um, and then our neuronal responses is a little period of silence, and then some uh, some action potentials as the thing goes down, and then another period of silence, and then maybe some more action potentials over here. Um, so maybe do something like that. Something like that. So um, then we do this. So the same stimulus to the fly again. So response on trial number one, 
in our response on trial number two. And if the response on trial number two has the same or nearly the same timing and over and over again across every, every hundred trials, we get almost exactly the same times every time, then, then that's, that's one possible result to have. Um, another possible result, possibility number one is this, uh, another possible result is, again, the same stimulus. Um, the first time we do it, this neuron gives a little burst, and then, a, and then an action potential, and then again a little burst, and then a couple action potentials. The next time we do it, the neuron does this. Um, and we do this across many, many trials. And in this case, over here, so possibility number one, Precise timing is present in our sensory encoders, in our sensory neurons. And then possibility number two is that rate, and, and, and this also by definition sort of implies um, that also rate is similar across different trials. The timings are all similar than the rates can be similar. Or possibility number two over here, the rate remains similar across all trials, but the timing is, um, is radically different, is highly variable. Um, and so, if, if we saw this case, then it would be wasteful and useless to have the rest of the brain pay attention to timing at all, because there's just nothing there that can even be informative. So, um, it, is, it would be a waste of the rest of the brain's energy to pay attention to the precise time. It should just be looking over a 1,500 millisecond window at how many spikes are fired. So, um, so if we saw possibility two, then that would imply right away that um, there's no reason to even look at timing in our classifiers, whether it's a natural classifier. Or, um, or an artificial classifier, um, we're wasting our time to build one that, um, that looks at timing. Does that make sense, right? Time, there's just nothing present there in timing. Uh, it's, not, it's not a reliable indicator of what's happening. Um, by contrast, if we saw the possible result number one, now um, it is, useful to look at timing. And um, the best artificial classifier will look at timing. If we want to build an ideal artificial classifier, we look at timing. But it's actually, so, so that's sort of point one. It's useful to look at timing. But there's a caveat to this. There's a sort of but. There's like a, it's a yes but sort of situation. Um, and, the, and the but to this is um, in this first case, maybe our nervous system puts a lot of precise timing into its inputs, but the rest of the brain is inefficient and ignores that. So, but maybe the rest of the brain is, um, is failing to make use of that potential juicy source of information. So, our ideal artificial classifier would look at timing. 
Um, but maybe the natural classifiers that exist in the world, inside all of our heads and inside the fly's head and whatever, um, should have done that if they wanted to be as good as possible, but for whatever reason, don't. Um, and so, so the first step in figuring out does the nervous system use timing is first of all, we better make sure that there's information present in time. That's not going to tell us for sure that that's what the brain uses, but our first step here is to make sure that there is some information present in time. Okay, so what questions do people have about that logic? So the, the, the result um, from this paper um, is that what they did is they, they chunked these time windows into precise, into sort of narrower time bands and, um, and converted, it's a little hard to see, but they converted these to binary just like you all saw with the peach and apple example yesterday in class. And what they found is that during a particular phase of the stimulus, there were some words that were frequently repeated by the neurons, some sequences of action potential um, that they saw the neuron say over and over again, um, and other words that were not spoken by the neuron. Even some words with the same number of spikes, so the same rate, but different patterns that they don't see. So they see some patterns, some, you know, maybe, maybe in some time window, typically you get between three and five spikes. Um, but those three and five spikes tend to have, there's sort of um, um, some sets of those three to five spikes that you see relatively frequently, and other, other possible three to five spike arrangements that you never see. Um, and so that tells us, that at least for the fly, um, we're, we're over here, we're in possibility number one. Um, and not possibility number two. That doesn't tell us that the brain's making use of it yet. This paper doesn't let, doesn't get us there. Um, but um, but it does tell us at least that, that it's worth our time to see if a brain might use that information. Okay. So what questions do people have about that so far? Yeah, sure. Why did they choose the timing windows that they did? Was it just arbitrary, or was there? Um, it's fairly arbitrary. Uh, you want to find, uh, um, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a fuzzy line between what's a broad time window and what's a narrow time window. Um, when you're looking at timing, you want to choose your time windows narrow enough that usually there's not more than one spike in a time window. And when you're looking at rate, you want to choose your time windows so that there's a range of number, different numbers of spikes from zero up to maybe 10 or 20 um, that you'll see in your time window. Um, but it is a bit of a fuzzy distinction between those. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm sort of presenting these as two sort of distinct possibilities. But um, you know, everybody agrees that it does matter somewhat, right? So if if um, uh, if my auditory system uh, fires, so if I hear something, my auditory system makes a response at that second, then that tells me, you know, that that happened, when that happened. Versus if I make that, see if I have the same response in my auditory system a minute later, then that means that I, the sound occurred, not at that time, but a later time. And so, you know, for, I mean, timing, at, at least a, a reasonably coarse time scale, of half second, tenth of a second, for sure matters. And that's another thing that there's widespread agreement about. The real question is, does the, like, precise millisecond, was it, was it, you know, two milliseconds after the stimulus or four milliseconds after the stimulus. Does that mean, first of all, does that mean something different? And this tells us it does mean something different. And second of all, what we're going to be getting to is, does the brain care? And does the brain use that information? And like I said, this is one example, this is like one of the first examples to show that there is precise timing present in the encoding side. Um, and so this actually, just to, to sort of, um, all of this, what we're doing is encoding experiment. And in an encoding experiment, um, what I mean by that is the brain does the encoding, and then we do the decoding. And so we're testing, in doing that, we're trying to test what the brain as an encoder does. Um, and we're not then looking at the animal's behavior and seeing what the animal perceived it saw. Um, that's what we're going to be getting to in a minute. But right now, we are um, 
we are just doing what, we, what, is, uh, what, I, what I would call an encoding experiment, meaning that, and so in, the, in, the, in these experiments, encoding happens somewhere and decoding happens somewhere else. So um, in an encoding experiment, that means um, the animal does the encoding. The animal does the pop top part, and then our computer does the decoding. Um, and so that tells us what information is present in the spikes that the animal's brain or the animal sensors have generated. Um, we don't yet have any basis for making inferences about what the rest of the brain's doing, because we haven't listened to or looked at what the animal does with that information. Does that distinction make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, what we're gonna do probably for the for almost the whole rest of the class period is work through together um, this paper here. It's a paper that is um, that was uh, uh, published now about a decade ago um, by uh, Eric Thompson, who at the time was a graduate student. Now he has his own lab, and William Prasad, when they were uh, working together at the University of uh, California in San Diego. Um, and let me uh, pull up the paper so we can look at it um, and look at a little bit about what they do with it. So. Okay, and so the animal that they are working on with this is a leech. Um, and they're sort of accepting everything that was done before on flies and other organisms that collectively showed that this is what goes on in a lot of different nervous systems. There is some useful information present in time. But we don't know what, if the rest of the brain is looking at this. And so their question is, does the rest of the brain make use of that? So our starting point is um, time is present in the encoding. And then the question is, does a brain, in this case the simple brain like a leech, use timing for decoding? So the organism that they're going to do this in is a leech. Um, and the reason that they chose to do this in the leech is um, because of, partially because of simplicity and partially because of some kind of uh, funky experimental manipulations you can do with the animal, we'll talk about in a second. Um, so a leech is, these are these, the, you know, uh, 300 years ago if you got sick and you went to the doctor, they'd probably stick these on you and get the blood out for who knows what. Um, actually, they're still used medicinally for some cases um, of poor circulation, but that's because they actually work for that. Um, uh, but mostly, uh, we've stopped just like giving people leeches for everything. You don't have to nails them. Um, but a leech is a pretty simple organism, and it's got some nice sort of features that allow us to test its, 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 um, its brain and sort of nervous system uh, easily. So a leech is essentially just a tube. There's like internal stuff like the digestive system and whatever, but we're just not going to worry about that. Um, so the leech is, is basically just a tube. It's just a cylinder. And so a cylinder, if you look at it in cross-section, is a circle. Um, and there is a left side and a right side to the leech, um, which we call the lateral sides, the lateral parts of the leech. Um, and, um, and then um, dorsal means back, so the, the thing is like a little tube like this, and so there's its back and its stomach side, um, dorsal and ventral side. Um, and so what we're going to do to this leech, um, because it's such a simple organism that doesn't feel pain in any sort of 
since that, that uh, is that we consider to be um, uh, important. Um, we um, we're just going to take it as a tube and cut along the back of the animal. Just cut it open. So you started with a cylinder, you cut along the back, and then you flatten it out. And so now you've gone from a cylinder to a sheet. So the organism is, is now converted to a sheet. And the part of the organism that used to be its back is now along the edges of our sheet. The part of the organism that used to be its sides are sort of halfway between the middle and the edge. And the part of the organism that used to be its belly is now in the middle of our sheet. Um, and then we cut a little hole in this. Um, and, and, um, and the leech has 30, no, 17 different segments to its body. And each segment has its own little mini brain that processes information from that segment called the ganglion. Um, and so we can cut up a little, cut a little hole in our, in our sheet um, of leech skin um, and then expose the little ganglion in there and record from neurons in this ganglion. Um, and leeches are very, very reproducible. They have the same approximately 300 neurons, uh, 200, 200 or 300 neurons in every ganglion that are in the same physical location. And so I can go from one organism to the next to the next and say I've got neuron PDL in this leech, and then same place go find neuron PDL in the next leech, find neuron PDL in the next leech. Um, and so we've got um, the, one of the nice things about the leech as well is that it has four touch sensors. Four, just four sensory neurons that are sensitive to touch in this whole segment of the animal. Um, and these four sensory neurons are, um, we call them pressure sensors. So pressure, DL, is, uh, is mostly sensitive to touch along the dorsal left of the animal. So back when the animal used to be a two, um, sort of in this quadrant here is what that one's sensitive to. Now that it's a sheet, it's sensitive to this zone here. Um, and then we have PVL, which is sensitive uh, to touch along the ventral left PVR, which is sensitive to touch along the ventral right, and then also PD. And so four, four sensors is already not very many to worry about, but they even narrow things down a little bit more because they only touch in the ventral half of the animal, between here and here. And so that means that they only have two sensory neurons that they have to worry about. And so PVL, the, the, the receptive field, um, or the location on the body that corresponds to the receptive field for PVL is this, uh, this, this um, ellipse here. And then the location on the body that corresponds to the receptive field for PVR, I wish they'd just call this R, because this should be alpha left and R for right, but you know, that's, that's uh, anyway, not the choice I would make. Um, oops, uh, and my pointer sign. Um, but anyway, this, this oval here, is our receptive field for um, PVR. Um, and so that's, that's what we've got. That, that's the whole system. And so we really only have two neurons that we even need to work. Two encoders, two sensors. And so we're just going to look at the response in these two neurons. And so what, we're, what we can do is poke. We'll take a little, take a little, um, take a little like uh, a stick, essentially, and poke the animal in precise, excuse me, in precise locations along its body, um, and then see what happens in those sensory neurons. So we poke over here on the left, and PVL, the left one, fires four action potentials. We're still inside the, the zone of the receptive field for the right neuron, so it responds too, but since it's a little bit more toward the edge of its zone, it only fires three action potentials. Um, and so that's, that's what we're going with here. That's, that's sort of our, our measurement. And 
One other nice feature about the leech is that we can actually also ask the animal, essentially, where it thinks it was touched. Um, and of course, we don't do that with language, but um, the animal um, has a reflexive behavior where if we touch it while it's, still, while it's still intact, if you poke the animal somewhere, it moves away from the poke. So poke it here, it moves away. And that behavior still happens in this um, sheet because we've left the muscles attached and the motor neurons are attached. So what's going to happen is we poke, this, we poke the animal. We're recording from these two neurons. So we see literally everything that is coming into the nervous system comes in on these two neurons. And so we see literally all of the information that the nervous system gets coming in, we can record. Then we can watch where the animal's movement is, and that tells us where the animal thinks it was touched, where it perceived the touch. And so we can actually um, record what goes on in the encoding, and then also observe the animal's behavior to give us a sense of the decoding. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's that's sort of the idea of this. Um, okay, a little bit. I'm gonna have a little bit more explanation before I pass out the papers for you all to look at. But before I do that, what questions do people have so far about that sort of setup of this experiment? Yeah, sure. How big are the inches? Um. This big around, maybe uh, maybe two or three centimeters, about an inch in diameter, um, and then the length for a fully grown adult leech is, I mean, they're like a hot dog, really. They're sort of about like this, maybe uh, maybe seven inches, um, uh, fifteen centimeters long, something like that. Um, so yeah, and and, um, and actually, one of the things um, that actually reminds me of an important thing. So. We're not going to measure measure our location. We actually measure in degrees because the leech used to be a circle, and so from um, from from this point all the way back around to this point is 360 degrees, and so every degree is one 360th. And so the diameter, or sorry, the circumference of the leech ends up being about um, about 350 um, uh, uh, millimeters. Um, Right? Yeah. Um, 35 millimeters. Um, so one degree is a tenth of um, uh, is a tenth of a millimeter, about. Um, but they measure the the, the thing in degrees. Um, so yeah. Um, other questions about that? Okay. Um, and so there's one other issue that what what, what they're going to do is a couple different measures, but one key measurement that they're going to make is they want to figure out whether the leech is using a rate or a timing to decode things. But there's this problem that we have, which is if I take, if I take my responses out, so I'm recording, we just have two, ne two neurons, so I'm recording response in PVL and response in PVR. Those are the two things that I'm recording. I can give that to a computer, and I can tell the computer just the number of action potentials in a given time window, just the rate, aka the count. Or I could give the computer the timing of every action potential. But that's sort of a silly experiment, because if I give the computer just the number of spikes, there were four, I just say, there were four spikes. You, in four spikes in PVL, three spikes in PVR, you figure out where the animals touch. It'll have a guess, but it'll probably be sort of poor. If instead I say there was a spike at 10 milliseconds, another spike at 30 milliseconds, another spike at 50 milliseconds, another spike at 75 milliseconds, and then in the other neuron there was a spike at 13 milliseconds, and another spike at... If I give it all of that, then I'm sort of... For sure the computer is going to do better if I give it all of the timings of all the spikes. So that would be an unfair comparison. And so one of the really clever things that they came up with is to do a more clever comparison which is not to do a more fair comparison, not to give their timing, in, in the case where they're testing the timing classifier, the artificial timing classifier, they don't give it the time of every spike, they just give it the time of the first spike. And they call that the latency. So that's the time of the first spike. 
Um, and that is now sort of in this part of our, of our Venn diagram here. It is different source of information that is a subset of the timing information. But the nice thing about it is with rate, I'm giving it one number for each neuron. Three spikes on PVL, four spikes on PVL. One number for each neuron. Here with this, I'm also giving it one number for each neuron. First spike on PVL happened at 10 milliseconds. The first spike at PVR happened at 15 milliseconds. Um, and, so, and so it's a much more sort of fair comparison where you can't deduce the rate given just the, the part of timing information that I'm giving. Does that make sense? OK, so I'm, I'm going to pass out the papers. And the first question is um, for our artificial decoders, what does better? Um, and the two options are rate or latency. And then question number two is, how does the animal's behavior compare to those two artificial classifiers? And the information for that is what you're going to find in, um, in this figure here, figure two. Um, and, so, uh, and so we'll spend. Let's aim for about seven minutes to, to try and come up with answers to those two questions. Um, and, then we'll, and then there's one other set of questions that we're going to talk about um, at the end of the class. So here again, I've got one copy for each group for this. Um, and so go ahead and get into groups and we'll, and we'll work through this. Actually, one other quick, quick note is this is these our, our, our experiment. This is an, in, again an encoding experiment because we are letting the animal's brain or sensors do the encoding, and then we're asking our computer to decode, or and then comparing it to the animal's brain does the encoding and the brain does the decoding, which is the black line on the on two H. And there's a little bit more time that you'll have to work, um, to work in the small groups as well. Um, okay, so for number one, question number one, um, our artificial decoder, we compare um, a latency-based decoder versus a rate-based decoder, which is the red versus the blue. Um, what is that telling us? What's, um, which one's got a better capacity for figuring it out? We can feed, our, feed our computer latency or feed our computer rate. Which one? Latency, yeah. So, so the latency one's doing better for our computer. Um, and I, I didn't really describe these charts, but what it, what it represents is, um, so if there is, um, uh, depending on how, if I, I want to compare um, how well my computer can tell the difference between a touch here versus here. So how far apart does, how far apart do two touches need to be for the computer to tell the difference between them? Um, and if I only give the computer the number of spikes, and since the time, the duration is the same, that's equivalent to the rate. So if I only tell it the rate, then it can tell within about 13 degrees 
the difference between a touch here and a touch here. So, you know, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's like, what, a millimeter? Um, on the, so, so there's about a millimeter precision that the computer has about where you touch. If instead I tell the computer not the whole timing of all the spikes, but I just tell the timing of the first spike on each of those two sensors, then it can tell me within five degrees, um, or four degrees or something, where the animal was touched. So my latency-based decoder is about three, maybe even three and a half times as precise as my timing-based, or as my, my rate-based decoder. Um, and so, um, and, and one of the groups was asking why that is. Um, and the reason that that is, is if you look, so if you look at the latency of one neuron, so if I touch at a particular location 12 degrees to the left of center, um, and I touch there five or six times, then on one of those neur on that neuron, I'm going to get a latency of about 40 milliseconds um, with a spread that goes from about 35 to 45. So it varies from one time to the next. If I touch in the same spot, the nervous system is not entirely precise, but it's got sort of this range of responses. And then again, for different touch locations, there are ranges of responses. If I touch at that same spot, minus 12 degrees, at a different um, I'm going to have anywhere between four and seven action potentials. And if I touch at the middle, I'm going to have anywhere between three and seven action potentials. Um, and the mean of that correlates, there's a, there's a slope to this line, it's not a flat line. So the mean number of spikes has some in indication of where the animal is being touched. Um, but on any particular trial, I, if I happened to touch and I got this, I got four spikes, you know, I would be hard pressed to tell you which one it is. My best guess would probably be it's way over here on number uh, minus 12 degrees, because um, that's the closest number to it. But um, it is a big, the vertical here represents across multiple trials at that same location, location plot on the x-axis, um, at that same location across many trials, how variable was the response? And so we just have more precision in, our, in, in the way the timing is encoded. Um, and we can also, instead of looking at the timing on one sensor, because we have two sensors, we can say, well, what's the difference? Which one fired first, and how much earlier did it fire? And so if I touch on the left, then the left neuron fires first, and since we're doing right minus left for our measurement for latency difference, then I get a negative number. Yeah, wait, I did that backwards. The left neuron fires sooner with a shorter latency, so we're doing left minus right, because um, there's a bigger latency on the right. Um, uh, and so then I get um, a negative number. Um, I get, and, and again, there's sort of a narrow spread across many trials. There's some precision here. Sometimes there's some overlap. It's not perfect, but there's some there's some precision here. Um, comparing to if I look at the count difference, I get a little bit better than if I just look at count on one. But again, with this rate-based decoder, I'm not getting a really precise answer here um, about what's going on. Um, there's a lot more spread here than there is over here. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Um, okay, so that's our first answer. Um, and then, so now, now looking at the animal's behavior, um, if I touch the animal at different locations, its ability to distinguish from touches on, you know, touch here versus touch here, how far apart do those need to be? Um, we can say, well, what's the animal like? And this group had some debate about what's the animal like here. So what was your sort of discussion about? Uh, so we were pretty split on whether, since the animals, uh, since the animal had 75% were around 12 seven? Yeah, like, seven or eight like degrees, degrees, something like that. Yeah. We were, so that was in between. Yeah. We were divided on whether it was just inefficient at latency or whether there's a mixture of both going on or yeah. there's something completely different. Yeah, that's, and I think that that's actually, um, I think that actually, in fact, there's not, based on this, not, not really any way to distinguish those possibilities. Um, so the possibilities you listed is, um, is it uses latency, but it's a little sloppy about it. Um, or it maybe uses a mix of latency and rate. Um, or what was the other one? Uh, that's something completely different. Or maybe it uses, yeah, maybe something else. Um, we'll sort of stick with these two for right now, but, um, but the something else is also possible. Um, what, what did other groups have to say about the second question? 
what, what, what conclusions did, did other people come to with this one? Um, Colleen, since you're making eye contact with me, what did you all discuss? <laughs> <laughs> um, we decided that latency was, was um, the better. <laughs> latency was better. So what, yeah. what do you mean latency is better? Um, that it seems to use latency more. What, okay, yeah. So, um, and so actually, one thing that this group didn't that, that this group didn't was as a possibility, and another possibility is it uses rate. Um, but what we can do uses rate only. Um, and actually, from this, we can exclude that as a possibility. We can cross that out. And it sounds like you also sort of cross that out as a possibility. And the reason that we can cross that out relates to what I was saying uh, about ten minutes ago, fifteen minutes ago. Um, if we built our classifier right, if we built our artificial classifier correctly, then, and, and they did, they were, they were careful about how they built it, then it is possible to prove that um, it will do as well as is um, at all possible for any, it, 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 it will do, the, it's going to be the best that it can possibly be in the universe given what you fed it as inputs. And so if we feed it, the correct relationship between stimulus and response, um, and we're going to assume that we've got that right, and we feed it the count, the number of spikes, and we're going to assume we got that right because we measured those very directly, um, then our artificial classifier, um, the rate-based classifier, is telling us the best anything can do if you only tell it rate is this right here. Um, and the animal beats that. So if the animal beats that, then we must not have given our classifier enough information. Does that make sense? We gave it rate, the animal does better, our classifier did as best as is physically possible with rate, and yet the animal beats it. So we didn't give it enough information. Um, and so maybe it uses rate plus latency, maybe, it, and maybe, it, maybe, or maybe it just uses latency, and it's certainly possible that the animal could do worse. Right? Maybe its brain is not an ideal classifier. We've built an ideal classifier, but maybe the brain isn't an ideal classifier. So maybe the brain only looks at latency, but doesn't pay attention to, uh, but, but, but just is sort of not as good as is physically possible with that information. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, for the homework due tomorrow, this is we're, 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 you don't need to discuss this paper, but we're actually going to return and discuss a little bit more about it in a minute. Um, the net, or not a minute, in, in a day tomorrow. Um, the next experiment that we're going to talk about as we continue our discussion of this paper is going to try to distinguish between these. So, which one is it? Is it being is it using latency, but it's a little sloppy about it, or is it using some mix and is it taking into account rate? And also, sort of a sub question is if it's using a mix. How much does it care about rate um, versus latency? Um, and so that's where we're going to be talking about tomorrow um, as we finish up our discussion of this. Then there's two more studies, one that we'll talk about very briefly in a monkey, and then one that we'll spend some time on that involves the mouse visual system that, um, that try to ask these same sorts of questions. So that's where we're going to